Thank you, Commissioner Mattel. I would generally adopt the examiner's report with some minor modifications. I conclude after an extensive investigation that Central Maine Power's advanced metering infrastructure, commonly referred to as smart meters, do not pose a credible threat to the health and safety of Central Maine Power's customers. I want to first address the minor changes that I would make to the examiner's report in adopting it. Um, run through those quickly. Page one, I would uh, insert after adequate utility service, I would add, and do not pose a credible risk of harm to customers as required by statute. Page two, I would eliminate the phrase consistent with federal and state energy policy. I don't find that section of the examiner's report to be particularly germane to the issue at hand in this case. Page 27, I would do some minor formatting to the figure, to figure one just to align the decimal places. I think if you align them, it becomes clear what order of magnitude we're talking about. Uh, page 34, after the phrase constitutes a safe, reasonable, and adequate utility service, I would insert the sentence, in determining safety as the court directed, we must answer the question as to whether the RF transmissions of smart meters represent a credible risk of harm to Central Maine Power's customers. I would, uh, again, delete the phrase promotion of state and federal energy policies. On page 50, I would delete the sentence, some of the studies indicate and replace with, some of the studies have shown evidence of a statistical association with cell phone use and brain tumor risk, but most studies have not so shown such an association. On page 52, I would add some language detailing the World Health Organization IR classifications, and I will address this in more detail in addressing Mr. Friedman's exceptions. I would also add a reference to the National Institutes of Health study concerning the WHO uh, IARC World Health Organization reclassification um, and the fact that cancer rates in the United States do not reflect the statistical risks that were identified um, by Dr. Hardell. On page 59 through 61, I would strike those sections G and H. Um, those refer back to the uh, the uh, federal and state energy policies. On page 66, the last paragraph, I'd strike the first sentence and replace it with continued research on both the thermal and non-thermal impacts on human health from radio frequency transmissions is ongoing. With respect to health and safety in a world of rapid technological change, it is important to periodically review safety standards for devices, which the FC, the Federal Communication Commission is currently doing with its open docket on RF standards. Um, and I think adding that, that goes before the last sentence there. This is especially the case given pervasiveness of RF. Um, and there'd be some, there's some language in that uh, FCC order opening the docket that I'd probably insert as a footnote um, on that. Now with respect to uh, Mr. Friedman's except exceptions, the Mr. Friedman's exceptions put forward the idea that somehow the examiner's report has sought to apply the safe, reasonable, and adequate statutory standard in a way that seeks to balance these three as competing standards. And I want to dispel any such notion. I see each of these statutory standards as an independent requirement. I think the examiner's report rightly reaches back to the flow of the court's decision on remand. The court order at page six lays out the statutory framework of the commission. It says the basic purpose of this regulatory system is to ensure safe, reasonable, and adequate service. The court goes on to conclude on page six that one of the commission's core regulatory responsibilities is to ensure that public utilities provide safe, reasonable, and adequate service. So at issue is, is that the commission in its opt-out orders never, quote, resolved Mr. Friedman's health and safety concerns. In fact, the commission explicitly declined to decide this issue in the opt-out investigation. The Commission's order made this clear, where it said, in initiating this investigation, we make no determination on the merits of health and safety. So the court concluded that the Commission, in its various orders, avoided addressing the issue, never made a clear statement that smart meter technology is not a credible threat to the health and safety of Central Maine Power's customers. 
Fundamentally, because the Commission explicitly declined to make a determination on the merits of health and safety concerns that were raised by the complainants in the opt-out investigation, the Commission's decision to treat these issues as resolved by that prior investigation was an error. And the court said, having never determined whether smart meter technology is safe, the Commission is in no position to conclude in this proceeding that requiring customers who elect either opt-out alternatives to pay a fee is not, quote, unreasonable or unjustly discriminatory. So I think the examiner's report correctly follows the court's reasoning of fundamental regulatory obligations being safe, reasonable, and adequate service. I think the examiner's report independently addresses the core regulatory requirements of the commission function, and in independently addressing them, it finds that smart meters are safe. Now, as we proceed, uh, Mr. Friedman at page 10 of the exceptions um, references unchallenged testimony um, that is therefore credible because it's unchallenged. I want to make it clear that I've read all the evidence presented in this case and considered it in coming to my decision. Some evidence carried more weight than other evidence. And unrebutted, unrebutted evidence does not simply on the face of its status as unrebutted make it true. All evidence needs to be critically examined, considered, and will influence the outcome of the decision maker, which was the case in my decision in this matter. At page 11, Mr. Friedman talks about Central Maine Power's burden of proof, the wrong standard of proof, specific causation, instead of credible threat of harm. And I, in response, I would say that as far as the legal process question goes, yes, Central Maine Power has the burden of proof once a complaint is filed. And they need to show that the meters are safe. Central Maine Power put forward a case which consi consisted of expert witnesses and numerous government studies the complainants put forward their case and a body of evidence to show that smart meters are not safe. Now, in working through that, I do not find that the burden question in this case is outcome determinative. There's a tremendous amount of evidence in the record concerning RF transmissions, particularly with respect to RF transmissions from cell phones. And in examining the evidence, I reached the conclusion that smart meters do not pose a credible threat of harm to human health. With respect to objections raised on the standard of proof being specific causation, I want to get I want to discuss that a little bit further, and it, it's kind of intertwined, I think, with Mr. Friedman's um, exceptions at page 13, discussion of the precautionary principle, and then the discussion about ignoring um, Hill's um, essay on causality and the who IR categories. So I'll try and address them all at, all at once. Uh, in reading Mr. Friedman's exceptions, along with Dr. Bradford Hill's essay, The Environment and Disease Association or Causation, along with the WHO IARC monograph on radio frequency, I want to put into context what my position is and what I believe the examiner's report position is. Dr. Hill's essay is very useful in assessing association between two variables and in the absence of scientific data that has fully defined a mechanism making a judgment as to likely causation. A classic example of this type of judgment was John Snow's conclusions during the cholera outbreak in London in 1854. Based on statistical associations, he made a compelling argument that the Broad Street pump water was the common source of the cholera outbreak. And it wasn't until 30 years later that Robert Koch actually isolated the bacteria and then so identified the mechanism. What Dr. Hill's essay lays out is a framework for evaluating associations and making a judgment concerning cause and effect with respect to that association. And this is all done in the absence of definitive scientific proof of causation. As Mr. Friedman quoted from Dr. Hill, quote, before deducing causation and taking action, we shall not invariably have to sit around awaiting the results of research. This was page 14 of I think it is useful to read Dr. Hill's statement in its full context. And I'll quote from that briefly. Where Dr. Hill in his essay says, quote, the cause of illness may be immediate and direct. It may be remote and indirect, underlying the observed association. But with the aims of occupational and almost synonymous preventative 
medicine in mind, the decisive question is where the frequency of the undesirable, undesirable event B will be influenced by a change in the environmental feature. How such a change exerts that influence may call for a great deal of research. However, before deducing causation and taking action, we shall not invariably have to sit around awaiting the results of research. The whole chain may have to be unraveled or a few links may suffice. It will depend on circumstances. Disregarding then any such problem in semantics, we have this situation. Our observations, and I emphasize this, our observations reveal an association between two variables, perfectly clear cut and beyond what we would care to attribute to the play of chance. What aspects of that association should we especially consider before deciding that the most likely interpretation of it is causation? Dr. Hill then goes on to lay out a number of ways to evaluate the association, including items such as strength of the association, consistency, temporality, exposure response, and physical plausibility. In essence, what Dr. Hill is doing is describing a methodology to apply inductive reasoning to move from particulars, in this case specific cases identified in epidemiology study, to universals, where the conclusion is causation, without waiting for a de deductive scientific proof of causation. In my view, the exceptions that Mr. Friedman takes with the examiner's standard of causation are really claiming that the examiner has applied a deductive causation standard. And I don't believe that is the case. In my review of the examiner's report, my review of the evidence, one can apply Dr. Hill's inductive causation standard and still conclude that while an association has been found by some studies, namely Dr. Hardell's, and the Interphone study, where a statistical positive association between exposure and cancer has been found, but chance, bias, or confounding cannot be ruled out, that the evidence is still too weak to support inductive causation. For instance, on the question of cell phone RF, the Health Council of the Netherlands applied the Bradford Hill criteria which again are inductive in nature, strength, consistency, temporality, exposure response, physical plausibility. And they concluded, and I quote, application of Bradford Hill considerations to the available epidemiological data is not supportive of a causal relation between the use of mobile phones and the occurrence of tumors in the head. So here you have an organization applying that inductive causal standard and finding that it's, it's not convincing. Now, uh, Dr. Little, who is a senior scientist at the Radiation Epidemiology Branch of the U.S. National Cancer Institute, a division of the National Institutes of Health, took the WHO IARC monograph reclassification of RF radiofrequency as a 2B carcinogen. And he examined the principal findings in light of actual occurrences of cancer in the U.S. Cancer Registry. And his team's conclusion was, and I quote, raised risks of glioma with mobile phone use, as reported by one Swedish study, meaning Hardell, formed the basis of IARC's reevaluation of the mobile phone exposure, are not consistent with observed incidence trends in U.S. population data. Although the U.S. data could be consistent with the modest excess risks in the Interphone study goes on then and says, based on the relative risks identified by Hartel, he says glioma rates should be about 44% higher than the observed incidence rates for 2008. So in looking at the evidence and applying Hill's criteria, I think it's fair to conclude that a statistical association may exist, but the criteria to advance down the inductive logic train and take action in light of a possible cause and effect relationship is not met. It must also be said that this whole discussion is premised on transferring the characteristics of cell phone transmissions and applying them to smart meters. I don't believe such a jump is warranted. The Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory explains why the Hill criteria is not appropriate to apply. 
they note that the Hill criteria cannot be applied and there are no research related observational results. It's inappropriate to presume an effect when sources differ in terms of their frequency, intensity, and proximity to critical biological tissues. With respect to um, the exceptions, Mr. Friedman's exceptions on remedy, um, because I conclude that smart meters are safe, I do not see that there's a need for a remedy. In fact, despite the fact that the meters are safe, customers still have the ability under the opt-out orders to use a non-transmitting meter. Obviously, as the opt-out orders enumerate, there's a cost associated with such an option. The cost is based on an underlying premise of rate making that seeks to assign cost to cost causation. In this case, the cost causation is fairly straightforward and customers have the opportunity of availing themselves of this option. So, in uh, conclusion, of, with respect to Friedman's, Mr. Friedman's uh, exceptions, I'd say that our job as an adjudicatory body in this case is to weigh the evidence and make a conclusion on safety. And in weighing that evidence, I did not see evidence that warrants a conclusion of either deductive or inductive causation of harm from smart meter transmissions, nor did I see evidence that persuades me that there's a credible threat of harm. The strongest evidence of harm is detailed by Dr. Hardell in his studies of cell phone use. His studies have mixed results, some showing that cell phone use provides a medical benefit and others showing an increased risk of harm. These studies are focused on statistical associations of cell phone usage and increased risk of brain cancer. In my view, to reach a standard of credible risk, as Dr. Hill lays out, the statistical associations would need to be much more robust be less subject to a variety of errors and biases, and would need to be actually reflect what cancer registry data across large populations reflects. Furthermore, it's important to note that cell phone studies do not reflect the frequency and magnitude of the RF transmissions associated with smart meters. Uh, with respect to opt-out rate making, um, in finding that smart meters are safe and pose no credible risk of harm, I re revert back to the opt-out orders res respect to providing customers a choice. This, I think, is the most reasonable approach. If customers still, still feel that they prefer a non-transmitting meter, they can opt out for such a meter under the fee structure in the opt-out orders. Customers who opt for non-transmitting meters put additional costs for their actions on the utility. The fundamental principle of cost causation in rate making demands that such costs be borne by those who cause them. Generally, in rate making, where there are common system costs which are difficult to attribute to specific customers, such costs will be socialized across the rate base. I don't think that is the case in the question before us. The costs are excuse me, assignable and attributable to the opt-out and thus should be borne by the opt-out customer. Now I want to briefly turn to the exceptions uh, filed by Ms. Wilkins, and I'd like to take some time to address those exceptions. Um, start by saying, sadly, when an examiner's report or a commission decision does not align with the party's position, rather than arguing on the merits of the case, it is easy to throw accusi accusations of bias at staff or make completely unfounded accusations that somehow staff were under some extreme pressure to reach a conclusion in the examiner's report. I take the issue of the integrity and unbiased fact-finding of the Commission and the process by which it reaches decisions very seriously. The public trust of the Commission's work is absolutely necessary for it to remain a viable means by which we administer the statutorily derived legislative mandate to ensure utilities provide safe, reasonable, and adequate service at just and reasonable rates. I have seen firsthand many parts of the world where corruption and bias completely undermine the public institutions, leaving little recourse for customers and at the same time making it very difficult for those same institutions to recruit employees, and commissioners for that matter, that uphold the highest ideals of integrity in their work. When unsubstantiated accusations are made, they needlessly undermine the foundation of public trust of the institution. While the accusations are unfounded, again, I want to briefly ex uh, address some of the particulars on the record. First, 
there's the accusation that the examiners are the exact same examiners that approve the AMI system. And this is simply not the case. Staff originally assigned in docket 2007 were Mr. Cohen, Mr. Buckley, Mr. Kivala, apologize for some of these pronunciations, some of these staff members are no, no longer uh, at the commission, they've retired. Ms. Monroe, Mr. Sukaskis, Mr. Howe, Ms. Huntington, Mr. Davidson. And with the examiner's report in that case was signed by Mr. Tannenbaum. There were no safety issues that were raised by any parties during that original proceeding. In this proceeding, the staff assigned to the case included Ms. Huntington, Ms. Monroe, Ms. Morancy, Mr. Tannenbaum, Mr. McCollman, and Ms. Raver. While there is some commonality of staff, I would acknowledge, but half of the assigned staff are different from the original case. The point of the accusation was that because they participated in that original approval, they're biased and have to reach the same conclusion. The second accusation says that blatantly and repeatedly the staff refused to look at safety issues. And I think in this statement it's unclear who the accusation is against, although I assume in the context of staff bias it is aimed at the staff. In any respect, it's a gross overstatement. I think it's important to note that in the Boxer Cook investigation it was a commission and not the staff that made a considered decision to not directly address the safety issue and instead decided to give customers an option to opt out. Uh, thirdly, with respect to uh, decisions about opening investigations and so, so on, the Commission made the decision to open the opt-out investigation and the Commission decided what the scope of that proceeding would be. The premise of the argument put forward by Ms. Wilkins is that um, she, she names 8,000 customers or so that complained, and the premise is that all those that have complained opted out of smart, meter, smart meters for health reasons. I think that's a faulty premise. I don't know why all those people complained, but I think there are a number of reasons why they might have complained. The fourth item in Ms. Wilkins' uh, exceptions is the charges level that staff failed to reconsider the opt-out order, forcing time and money to spend on a court appeal therefore the staff is biased. I want to reiterate the staff do not make decisions on what the Commission decides to reconsider or not reconsider. Reconsideration decisions are made by the Commission. So to accuse the staff that they are biased because they did not prevail on the Commission to reconsider the opt-out order is, is really an empty accusation. It's reconsideration not a function of staff, it's a function of commissioners. Fifth point in um, Ms. Wilkins' exceptions is, it, is the accusation that staff is biased because the court ruled against all of the staff's previous recommendations and specifically ordered the PUC to abide by the law and open an investigation into the safety of the smart meter system. Again, I think this accusation is unfounded. The reality is the law court upheld all of the commission's findings. They simply reversed the commission's decision where the commission limited the scope to not include an examination of whether smart meters are safe. The Commission then, on receiving the court's decision, promptly opened an investigation into safety. Again, the court's decision is not reflective on staff, but rather the decision makers, the commissioners. And in no way does it impugn some kind of bias on the commissioners who made that decision. The sixth point was that, uh, and this, the sixth point kind of intertwines the management audit of CMP's AMI system with the conclusion that staff is under extreme pressure to redeem themselves, save their jobs, and save their reputations. The first assumption here is that staff involved in the original approval of AMI is the same staff involved in this case. And that's not the case. Three of the six members on this case were not involved in the original case. Probably the most objectionable point, though, here is the insinuation that somehow staff are under pressure from somewhere concerning their recommendations. And such an insinuation could be no further from the truth. I value staff for their ability to untangle sometimes difficult and complex interrelationships between the law, engineering, and economics. I need a staff that is unafraid to assemble facts into positions, regardless of the popularity of that position. If I express an opinion that is based on a faulty set of facts or assumptions, I want a staff that will challenge me on that opinion and provide me with a solid set of facts that challenge my opinion. 
I have no need to surround myself by a set of yes men or yes women. The insinuation that somehow staff are scared that they will lose their jobs because of an opinion in an examiner's report would defeat the whole purpose of what I value in staff. This accusation while aimed at staff is really an accusation against the commissioners, and I wholeheartedly reject the accusation and the premise behind it. The reality is everyone working here takes the same electricity service as the rest of Maine customers. We all have families, we have young children, we have vulnerable children with disabilities. If the facts pointed to a safety hazard, we would act on it. With respect to the evidence, staff did not work to exclude evidence. Staff evaluated the evidence and admitted pursuant to Maine law and rules of procedure that evidence that was relevant and admissible. It is worth pointing out that staff, over the objections of Central Maine Power, allowed Ms. Wilkins and other interveners to put forward evidence not sponsored by a witness in endeavoring to broadly interpret the Commission's hearsay rules. I would note that the interveners and public witnesses offered 286 discrete documents for the record. There were 327 total filings, 38 of them were duplicates, three were withdrawn by the interveners. Of these 286 remaining, 100 of them could be considered peer-reviewed published research. Of the 159 were admitted into the evidentiary record, 46, um, 47 with one duplicate. So 46 of the 287 total documents were simply lists of citations to and abstracts from various journals and studies. None of these items were ever produced by the interveners um, for review. So in conclusion, a recommendation by staff or a decision by the commission, which goes against the party is not evidence of bias. The tenor of Ms. Wilkins' allegations, the lack of factual basis for them, is extremely disappointing. So in conclusion, I would conclude that smart meters are safe. I would adopt the examiner's report with the modifications I've noted. And uh, maybe at this point, that's really my prepared remarks. There are some areas of what I heard from Commissioner Littell that um, I would disagree with. Maybe we can, I'm not sure how you want to proceed as far as discussion of those areas of agreement or the areas of disagreement. Now let's take a small one first and then I'll uh, talk about where we're at. I think I saw a reference in CMPs um, to CMPs exceptions. I think I detailed what of the complainant's exceptions I would grant and the others that I didn't detail I wouldn't grant. Um, for CMPs, I asked staff to look at it because they're really technical issues. Staff um, reviewed the record and noted that CMP's exceptions represent an um, interpretation of the data, but they couldn't confirm from the record that they are an accurate interpretation of the data or not. It really goes to a mean and mode issue. So my thought there would be, since it is an interpretation of the record, would be not to adopt it since staff couldn't confirm it. But that's my, that's my thought on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with uh, leaving the examiner's report on uh, exposures the way it is. And then step back and talk about where we're at. I think where we're at is we both reach a conclusion that the meters are safe, um, but our opinions and approaches are very different. You'd adopt the examiner's report. I would adopt the um, the reasoning that I've adopted that I've put forward. I find some of the complainants' evidence to be credible. Um, I think from your statement, I you can speak to, to your view of that. Um, and um, I would address the issue with shifting the burden by rewriting the report. Uh, but most importantly, I would make the um, a, a limited um, exception to the opt-out for medical um, medical reasons when recommended by a treating physician. So um, I think there's some significant differences. I do agree with many of the, the individual points you made, but how I put them together in an opinion is sort of very different than the approach that you made. So that's my observation on <coughs> where we're at. I'll turn it back to you, Commissioner Minoy, for us to sort well, out how we proceed. Yeah, maybe, I, th I think the, the thing that we can agree on is that the meters are safe. I think the, the, reasons that you lay out for a medical opt-out um, I would disagree with 
Um, I think the first analogy that you make is to the World Health Organization's extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields, ELF, ELF, EMF, how's that for an abbreviation? Um, and I, I would not do that. I think um, there are significant differences between extremely low frequency. When we talk about extremely low frequency, we're talking about um, transmission lines that are, have a frequency of roughly 60 hertz. Um, the meters that we're talking about are operating in the, in the gigahertz range. Um, very different um, source of uh, transmission. And where this plays out is in the electromagnetic properties of how they interact with tissues, um, specifically permittivity, the ability um, or the resistance to forming a magnetic field of the tissue, um, the conductivity of the tissues. These are all affected by the frequency of the exposure. So you have different physical mechanisms for, for coupling, the ability to excite muscle, cardiac, nervous tissues, all of those things for extremely low frequency are, are very different. Um, in ELF, EMF situations, you have decoupled magnetic fields from the actual power of the signal. So you actually have to measure the magnetic field in milligauss, whereas in RF EMF, the magnetic field is not decoupled. It can simply be described by the energy of the RF signal. Uh, so all of those reasons play into why the World Health Organization and other agencies have, have have separated these transmissions and have looked at and evaluated their effects separately. And I think in drawing an analogy between the two and then moving down the train that you've moved down, you're conflating the two and they're very different. Um, now, getting to how you use the analogy of the two, you know, the extremely low frequency EMF in the WHO report, the WHO report does support low cost or no cost mitigation strategies. So setting aside the point that the fields are completely different, if you look at the actual effects on the customer base, in an ELF scenario, ELF EMF scenario, you typically have these high voltage transmission lines. These transmission lines are serving the majority of the customers in the region. Um, and you, because you're serving the majority and you're mitigating, you, you need to go back to the principle of cost causation. If one to, were to undertake a low-cost mitigation strategy for an abutter along a transmission line, the costs are generally socialized because the line serves the electrical needs of a large number of customers. Those, all those customers benefit, and therefore, low-cost or no-cost mitigation measure, measures are socialized. Um, so I, in the, you know, I laid out previously, in this case, you actually have a meter on a house. You found that that meter is safe. Um, but you have the opt-out orders, and I'm not, I'm not seeking to disturb the opt-out orders. I'm just leaving the opt-out orders as they are. So the customers have an opportunity to change out their meter if they so desire, but that causes costs to the system, and those costs to the system are not um, beneficial to the other customers. So it's pretty straightforward, in my view, to assign the cost to the customer that's causing the cost. Um, and I, I guess as I'm trying to put our two positions together here, and, you know, if you look at the practical outcome of our two positions, my position is that they're safe, there's no credible threat of harm to Central Maine Power's customers, I would not disturb the opt-out orders, there would be opportunity if somebody, for whatever reason, does not want a meter, they can opt out, pay the cost. And, I, again, I'm describing the practical outcomes. I know there's more nuance to your position, but your position is basically to say that the, 
that the meters are safe, but in essence you're making it conditional on the rate making treatment of the opt-out. And for me, the meters are safe or they're not safe. It has nothing to be nothing to do with an economic rate making treatment. And I think that's where the fundamental difference it, it, difference is between our two positions. I I think it's a simple test. They're they're safer than not with all the things that I've said, um, but safety is not a function of rate making treatment of an opt out. Um, let's see. I, I got three major points there, so. <coughs> But I'll just um, no for on the first one the uh, parallels or not between the commission's treatment and the World Health Organization's treatment of um, high voltage um, electromagnetic fields and um, RF fields I don't raise it to argue that they're the same I recognize that the magnitude of the exposures are different and indeed they're researched by science differently they're different portions of the magnetic spectrum. So the points on um, the technical detail and how they may impact um, people and exposures are studied differently. My sole purpose in raising it, I should say sole, my multiple purposes in raising it, are one, to know that from a regulatory construct perspective, which is our job, they're very parallel situations. The World Health Organization has classified both ELF from high voltage lines and RF, radio frequency radiation, as possible human carcinogens. And in the one and they've recommended low cost measures for the, the better known and better researched um, high voltage impacts from ELF um, that have been around and, and have come some concern for four decades as I noted. Um, and in this case it seems to me um, our regulatory, if we were to approach it the same way we would be consistent as between the two different. I don't. I I, I take it from um, Commissioner Noy's comments that um, he doesn't agree with that point. But that's that's my point. Is that they're parallel? I think we're in similar situations from a regulatory point of view. Um, and consistency between that and how we treat those cases, um, the NPRP cases, the um, Curtis case, the Fournier case, um, suggests that the parallel to me is is, is fairly complete. Although I acknowledge the science on RF has only been developed over the last, it really took off in the 90s, um, mid 90s, when a lot of cellular phones and other devices um, became very prevalent in use. So it is not as mature as the science um, in the uh, high voltage area. So it's a regulatory analogy, not a science um, analogy. Um, and on uh, the cost causation point, I think it's important, and I, I do address this in my opinion, to recognize that um, electricity service is really a considered, in my view, an essential service now. Almost every residence in Maine has electricity service. Some of them are off the grid, but have um, electricity service from their own sources. Um, but the vast majority of residents and buildings in Maine, um, overwhelming majority, have electrical service. So to some extent, the change of standard equipment that is to be used is an involuntary decision on the rate payers. And, and to me, that's a consideration that, that um, makes it more parallel to the situation of someone living next to a high voltage line um, than not. So that, I think, is a difference in how we construct what, what the cost causer is and who the cost causer is um, and not. So I would I would be reluctant to do, although it was the commission's prior reasoning in the opt-out order to say you have the option to pay um, and you can pay. That was that was the prior reasoning that the law court, at least because we didn't make the finding, rejected. I think it's an open issue and the opinion on what they would find if we went up and said we made the finding and we're still sticking those opt-outs, that, that's, that's an open legal question to which we may get an answer. Um, and then lastly, on the safe or not safe point, um, I spent a lot of time in what I said and, and more time in, in what I wrote in saying when we're dealing with complex issues of um, multiple causations, attribution, studies on areas where um, when you do population level studies or cohort studies, um, 
isolating variables with human populations or non-laboratory animal populations is very hard. Um, when you're doing genetic studies with laboratory animals in vitro or in vivo, um, you know, the studies will, with slight changes in variables, produce different results. And the purpose of replicating those and examining those, is, those studies is to determine what, why you're seeing those differences and not. And there's differences in interpretation um, even on those studies, though I acknowledge the main basis, I think it's important to recognize for the World Health Organization finding, Dr. Hardell's um, testimony is the epidemiological research on just the animal studies. The ability to find that mechanism is still an issue under uh, research, but if it were that sole basis, I don't know that I would reach the same, the same, same conclusion. I do that the science is credible. Um, the point is these, these issues are they're not black and white, um, and um, so that that's sort of my nuanced um, view for why I think we should credit the, the testimony that we've received and um, allow for the limited opt-out, which I understand um, Commissioner Renoy um, is concerned with. So with that, do you? Uh, uh, no, I think I think we disagree on that. Um, I think I, I do credit the evidence that's in the, and I evaluated it, so I'm not saying, um, you know, I just, I just come to a different conclusion. I come to a different conclusion on Dr., on the credibility of Dr. Hotel's testimony, for instance. You credit that, I think, with more weight than I credit that. I think that's fair. Um, well, I, th I think where we're at is, is, um, different opinions with different reasoning um, and um, I think that's I think that's where we're at I think that is where we're at I think we both agree they're safe and we have different reasons for that I have everything you need okay so I'll get you my opinion and we'll get it done as, as uh, expeditious as we can Thank you. This concludes deliberations. <coughs>